Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So what you're looking at here is the supernova reactor and we have to return this uh, imminently and uh, I wanted to do the test that I have uh, been wanting to think about a lot more before I did it and get things in place so that I could do it and uh, it's now time to try and do this test before we return it. It's the only real test that I wanted to do with the supernova reactor, um, which was uh, to test the potential for synthesis in the dusty plasma environment of cold neutrinos, uh, triggering the decay of 14 uh, carbon in uh, charcoal powder. And we discussed this uh, yesterday. So um, that's the test. This charcoal was actually prepared um, uh, before I went to uh, see Roy Shinomaza in Japan uh, in those early parts of the year and I will share the video of the preparation process for this that I made at that time and of the filling of the uh, steel cell that was actually made in California uh, to my instructions and uh, with the suggestions of and by uh, 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 Alan Goldwater. So thank you very much Alan for preparing that. We'll see if that works. Now, um, actually, if you look at the back of this, when we did the initial uh, test, uh, when the owner came in and showed me uh, how it operated, um, we didn't have a cooler for this uh, because there was a cooler, but it didn't have a power supply. And when we put a power supply on, it basically died uh, because it actually needs pulse width modulation control. Anyway, that blows, uh, it's, a, it's actually a Dell server fan from old type servers. And you can buy these online, but they actually uh, suck in the air here and they blow it out there. It's called a blower and it does, it does blow quite a tornado. It makes quite a racket as well, but then the overall device makes quite a noise. Anyway, but uh, when we come to look at the sound from this, we will want to characterize the noise from the blower on its own turned on and going through there so that maybe we can extract that from any potential signal noise uh, or the actual operation noise of the magnetron with the particular uh, resonant um, uh, quartz uh, reactor core in there. Anyway, so th this was blown up and uh, fortunately I managed to find three uh, like this. Uh, from uh, Greece uh, on eBay and they came with the heatsink. It wasn't so cheap but it was affordable uh, and so there's the original one which is dead and uh, this is uh, one that I uh, purchased of three uh, and I haven't looked at this one but the first one I looked at I took the heatsink off and it was this one and this one is dead so we then had two dead ones uh, but then the second one I looked at was this one and this one worked, uh, it actually span round, but uh, because you were only giving it one pulse, it kind of froze um, uh, after that initial pulse. So I needed a pulse width modulator controller and a power supply suitable to run it. So I purchased this relatively affordable uh, 3 amp uh, 12 volt power supply. Uh, it needs 2.65 amps and really it doesn't even start to think about moving unless it has that. Um, and so I got that, and then I wanted a pulse width modulation uh, to control it with, and I, in my local electronics uh, hobby shop, uh, didn't have uh, any of them in stock. And so I thought, well, you know, how about a, a, a light dimmer, like an LED light dimmer? And uh, what I actually found was um, that I had a light dimmer, a LED light dimmer in the house, uh, and uh, it worked, so I just wanted a single channel one. So I went and bought this, was a really affordable little uh, unit, this LED uh, controller here. And uh, it came with this uh, radio frequency um, remote. And I think the whole lot was like, uh, I think it was like about $5 or six, no more than $7, I don't think. Um, so that was a, a big win, and I'm just gonna demonstrate that. So I'm gonna pause, set it up, and uh, just demonstrate that operating. So I've plugged that in and you can trace it over here and basically it has a, a normal sort of 12 volt kind of uh, pin out here and I plug that into the um, RF controller and that goes in and uh, it's essentially the red and the black lines um, as you can see on this one over here which is dead. Um, and so we have our graveyard over here, our spare and uh, the one that I'm going to demonstrate now. So in theory if I hit this on 
starts and dials up and it's so powerful it'll blow itself across the table so this uh, is really really good cooler for a Magnatron and uh, this whole setup is quite affordable we can actually dial to 50% so this is our uh, little uh, remote controllable um, uh, fan for cooling the uh, supernova so I'm quite chuffed with that uh, affordable solution there so again we turn it on You dial it to 100%, it kind of goes down and then speeds up. 50%, 25%, and we'll turn it off. Turn it on again. And it remembers where it was when it last left off, which I think is quite cute as well. So there we have it. We have a Wi-Fi, uh, or sorry, a radio controlled um, uh, control for the fan and, and this is quite satisfying because getting as far away from this as possible is something I want to do. So in terms of instrument package for observing this um, I'm going to look to put some of those uh, self-developing x-rays on the outside of this in various points including uh, quite close to the outside here and maybe in the crack and on here I don't know we'll, we'll have a look at that. Um, so that's maybe to look for anything that would come through to them. And then um, we have a high-speed camera here, the Hero 3, that we used uh, for the sprites in, um, uh, and various other uses. So um, this will be looking uh, somewhere close to the uh, end here, or maybe after a, a one or other runs, uh, we'll look down the, the head of that. But really, um, because this is the only path, if there is beta particles made in the core, the only way, way they can really come out is down this uh, tube. Um, we're going to have uh, this uh, uh, pancake uh, detector uh, set into uh, beta mode so we can switch across and, and set it into uh, beta mode and uh, with that in play um, let's see it's in beta mode this would be over here uh, uh, looking down the end of the tunnel uh, and maybe we will see an increase from background in beta in there. That will maybe give us an immediate indication. Although it is quite a, f a path for it to travel down and there's also lots of dust going around. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see if we see anything there. Um, and then also we have a, a microwave uh, sensor here in this e-smog meter. And uh, when we ran our original sort of normal Nova testing, the uh, microwaves leaking from that were absolutely horrendous, that no Wi-Fi in a very large area worked. Um, and uh, this was kind of off the charts. But when we tested this uh, um, uh, some time ago, uh, we did notice that the Wi-Fi was not too bad um, uh, coming out of this device. So that's uh, quite reassuring. And then, of course, uh, we've got the ultrasonic mic. And as I said earlier, when we are uh, testing these fans, We'll, we'll do a test with the fan in situ at the back here to hear the kind of background noise that that makes. And then uh, we'll have that to, to, that we can take out of the signal. And then we will use this. And now these actual, these tube, uh, reactor cores here in which we put the carbon. So we put the carbon here and um, uh, we put that into these cores. These cores are, are different diameters, so they will have different sound resonant modes. And if you look at the work that I've shared uh, and translated of uh, Mashinsky, uh, sound uh, could be extremely fundamental for uh, getting electrons uh, to pair up, forming Cooper pairs, and so that they collapse into the inner shell up to 22 electrons uh, for titanium. And uh, so it could be very important to have this in high intensity sound, uh, which also could feed the EVOs, them being bosons. Uh, and so forth. And so um, uh, we have two different uh, uh, reactor cores here. So we'll try a couple. And it, with the um, uh, igniter rod, uh, we found that actually some of the elements we observed uh, in the um, uh, case of the testing that we did with Nova and Supernova, uh, some of the elements were already in the um, lead. Uh, pencil. When I say lead, it's supposedly graphite, but um, uh, there may be fillers or binders in there. And we found that there were some elements in there which uh, drew some 
crit allowed some criticism and legitimate criticism of the elements that were found in the um, uh, ash from the reaction. And this is why I felt I had to come up with something that was completely independent of the fact that it, it was carbon going in there of some form and uh, that might contain elements if it's coming from charcoal and um, uh, the lead uh, pencil that acts as an igniter. In fact, the way that, the way that it acts as an igniter is you put the, the pencil in and you get a field over it so you, you get a voltage potential. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, heats up like if you take a, a, a high current low voltage like nine volt battery even if, if you get a lead pencil uh, 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 like I say a, a 0.1 of a millimeter or 0.2 of a millimeter and you put that across a nine volt battery terminals uh, that will actually glow like an arc lamp and so that that heats up and gets the plasma going um, but with the combination of the potential elements that are already in charcoal and the uh, potential elements that are already in the lead pencil, um, there's some room for a legitimate criticism of any potential uh, synthesis of elements. So with this uh, concept of uh, the potential for the formation of cold neutrinos and for the uh, um, uh, stimulated decay of the 5730 plus or minus 40, something like that, uh, half-life of carbon-14 that should be in this charcoal-based uh, carbon, um, uh, we can discount all of those contaminants and uh, prove something that is really, really quite interesting to think about. Uh, and the reason I say that uh, I will come into at a later time, um, but uh, it has implications uh, for health and well-being and uh, lots of other things. Um, but uh, firstly, um, if this does show, having been in one of these and in here for three minutes, that it has uh, gone from being a few years old to 10 or 100,000 years old uh, based on the ratio of uh, 12, 13 and 14 carbon uh, isotopes, then we can conclusively say that something stimulated the beta decay of the uh, carbon-14 in there and therefore we need to think what that might be and it, it, uh, the most likely thing uh, is uh, at the moment uh, cold neutrinos so uh, that's it that's the kind of like instrument package um, uh, we could have a uh, power monitor on the uh, input power for the whole controller here which might be interesting just as a, um, a thought uh, but we are not looking for that per se because um, it's this is really about radiation remediation and the actual underlying process because if you know, the reason uh, Alexander Parkamov used Cobalt-60 is because it's got something like a three-point-something year half-life, uh, and uh, it's man-made, but that beta uh, isotope has a... It's stable enough to exist long enough for you to do an experiment, but it's really, really a short half-life compared to something like a Strontium-90 or, or uh, Yttrium-90. So if it's, like, ten times more likely to decay, then it's, um, uh, you know, a lot more... Uh, uh, susceptible in theory uh, to uh, the the decay process, whatever is causing that. In the case of this, it's obviously uh, a lot less uh, susceptible uh, than that, with a 5,730 plus or minus 40 years. Uh, and of course, if you're looking at uh, potassium 40, that is much, much less susceptible. In fact, we may actually run some potassium carbonate, as I showed you yesterday in there and again with the with the uh, beta detection in there so that's essentially what i would like to do i hope i get to do it over the next couple of days um and then uh get this little beauty back to its owner so thank you very much uh i have to say uh, <laughs> they were they were very patient uh we, we didn't want to waste these uh precious uh um uh, quartz uh, reaction vessels because they they're just not you can't just come by them so uh, I, I wanted to have a, a test that would actually have meaning um, if if this works then one could consider rather than putting carbon uh, 14 in there or, or, or whatever if you put say cesium 137 in a similar kind of environment um, uh, it would that actually cause the stimulated decay so you you'd have the the, the dusty plasma from the carbon to to create the environment, to create the evos, to create the uh, the cold neutrinos, and and those would then go and do the work of um, removing the radioactive material. So um, 
you know, it's it's a shot in the dark. Uh, uh, it has some principles behind it, and you don't know if you don't look. So thank you very much for your time.